Welcome to Sarder TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton, and today I have the pleasure of talking with Marie Schweitzer, Professor of Operations, Information, and Decisions at the Wharton School, and co-author of Friend and Foe. Maurice, thank you so much for being here with us today. Uh, thank you. Let me start by asking you, what advice do you give your students and young people who are entering this complex business world today? Yeah, if you're starting off today, I think that there are two key things you need to be thinking about. One is building relationships. It's your network that's going to be important for you throughout your whole career. And the other is making sure you're investing in your learning. That is, mm -hmm. you have to be constantly learning no matter what position you're in. It should be one where you're growing and learning and developing your capabilities mm -hmm. because the world is changing at a rate that we need to keep developing and investing in ourselves. And how is networking changing these days with, in the digital space? And is there any advice for good networking? Networking has always been important. And I think today with social media, we have the opportunity to network in a way that's different than it was before. Mm. We can network with more people and stay, we can maintain a lot of loose ties. And those loose ties actually turn to be pretty important. What are some of your tips for successful negotiations? Well, for negotiations, there are two key ideas. And it's going to sound a little bit like my last advice. But for negotiations, there are relationships and there's information. And we need to develop these relationships, and we need to gather information. And my overarching advice is to think about active listening. Mm. Active listening is actually something that came out of the crisis negotiation literature. When we listen to people actively, we're doing a few things. One is we're asking questions. The second is we're mirroring back the behavior of people that we're talking to, mm. or the gist of what somebody has just said. And then we're really listening. That is, we're leaving time and space to listen to their response. Now, if we do that well, it actually accomplishes a few different things. First, it allows us to convey that we're really paying attention to somebody. And people are flattered that you're interested in understanding my issues, my problems. Second, it helps us gain perspective. That is, we're really focusing in on somebody. And then third, we're actually learning information. That is, we're going to get that information. And I've seen it in negotiations. I've seen people talk over somebody else's response. So somebody else is giving information, but we often misperceive the negotiation project as something where it's my arguments. And if I deliver great arguments, I'm going to convince you to see things my way. And instead, the key to negotiations is to really figure out what are your interests and how can we address both of our interests? Because if I really understand your problem, I can figure out how to solve that in a way that also helps me. And I think that's the key to negotiations. So going in with a sense that this is not a zero-sum game, does that Absolutely. help? Absolutely. And I think our book is really about that, is it's mm. friend and foe in all of our relationships, even the very competitive ones. Mm we are both collaborating and competing. And you know, from the national stage, the United States and China, the United States and Russia, you can think of adversarial elements of our relationships, but they're also collaborative ones. We have to be intensely collaborative and competitive. And the same is true in negotiations, absolutely. If, if we just try to beat the other side, they're going to respond with a very competitive posture. We won't make progress. Mm -hmm. What are some of the principles of conflict management that are helpful, especially for people just starting out in their career? I think of negotiations as we, we try to seek opportunities where we can both perhaps do better. And sometimes we have conflicts that reflect some dispute. So maybe we come into, there's something that, that happened, maybe it's neighbors and one neighbor did something that harmed the other, or it could be at work, somebody claimed credit for something that they should have been more generous about. There are these conflicts that will constantly arise. And there, we need to think about the same kinds of things. So the act of listening, trying to understand the other side's perspective. But we also have to do something else, is we have to dis diffuse some of this tension. Mm. And we can do that by acknowledging somebody else's concerns or the harm that they've suffered. 
and then we might have to change people's emotions. So often people will come in angry. Mm. We think about how can we diffuse that anger? And sometimes acknowledging it, making a concession, giving people some time, an apology, if you believe that's going to be helpful, and often it will be. We can do things to shift people from a place of anger into one that's more constructive. And often people want to be heard, and they feel like you're blocking their goal in a way that's not helping them realize where they want to get. And, and sometimes people, all they want is an apology. Sometimes they just want to be heard. And we can do that. The last idea I sort of offer is that um, sometimes when people are really upset about something, sometimes the best way is to shift the topic onto something else. That is, mm. we can sometimes, if we perseverate on something, we just get stuck in this anger place. And when we shift gears and focus on something else, we can sometimes get to somewhere else that's going to be much better. You say that there is an art and a science to making strategic decisions. What are some of the best practices that you have for good decision making? I'd offer a couple of ideas. Um, one, we often underinvest in flexibility. And I think this is broadly related to this idea about networking and investing in your own education and learning. We need to be flexible. The world changes, it's dynamic, things are unstable. We might end up in a different field, doing different work, the organization we're in could change. We need to be flexible. And so as we make strategic decisions, we need to think about what the world is likely to be like, but also think about what it could be like if it's much better than we think or much worse than we think, and be more flexible than we typically anticipate. That is, we can make our best guess, but it sometimes makes sense to invest in additional flexibility. So it's like packing the umbrella, or we might build our new factory in a way that might have higher ceilings than we need or can be leased out if we find the demand is much less than we anticipate or we might rent. That is, we might think about ways for us to be able to scale up or scale down as needed. Another idea about thinking about our strategic decisions, uh, and this is work that you know, Chip Heath and others have talked about, you can think about a decision, what that would feel like 10 minutes from now, mm. 10 days from now, 10 years from now. And as we do that, we're going to force ourselves to think ahead in a way that we typically don't think ahead as rigorously as we, as we ought to. So those two ideas, I think, will help guide our decision making. Why is trust such an important element in organizations? And how can managers develop it? So trust is uh, essential. That is, trust enables people to be vulnerable and to do things like share information. So maybe I'm in an organization and I understand some software or I understand how to network with this client or get things done in a particular way. I have this information that makes me valuable. In an organization, we need people to share information. For us to really tap the potential of our organization, we need knowledge mm -hmm. to flow. We need people to trust others. When I say, oh, I need you to do me this favor or work longer or take this other assignment, you have to trust me that I'm going to take care of you later on right. and that I'll remember it and, and recognize your investment. So without trust, leaders really can't lead and organizations don't function well. So trust is really essential. It's essential for organizations. It's essential for economies. Now, we think about how do we build trust. And interestingly, um, you know, I said that when we trust others, we're willing to be vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we have to be vulnerable first. So you think about sort of the opposite of this. That is, uh, suppose two people are getting married, and right before the wedding, one says, oh, I need a prenuptial agreement. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that signal? Yeah. It signals a lack of trust. And with that lack of trust, it can be so corrosive that we end up unraveling that relationship because I haven't made myself vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And there are other ways we can sort of think about vulnerability, but when we make ourselves vulnerable, we engender trust. So sometimes that, that means we share information. So I might go first and say, hey, let me show you, here are things that I know, or let me open the books for you. Let me show you some information that helps you out. 
in relations with people sometimes reveal embarrassing stories or they go si sing karaoke together. Mm -hmm. So we do things that make ourselves a little bit vulnerable to yeah. other people. It's like one reason why drinking together can sometimes help people bond. Yeah. So we can make ourselves vulnerable. Another key idea is to think about, there's sort of two key things. One is competence, another is warmth. So I can demonstrate high competence and that'll instill your trust. That is, if I'm competent, then you know that you can trust me to make good decisions, to understand the landscape, the competitive landscape. So competence is important, but the other is warmth. Mm. And warmth means this is somebody that you like, that you think is kind and benevolent. And this is somebody, for example, who might donate their time or uh, take care of a sick relative. My favorite example of this is presidents get dogs. Now, since the advent of television, Eisenhower, we've had every American president has had a dog in the White House. So true. And what's fun is this, the, the sort of presidential sort of like a uh, canine imperative, it extended <laughs> to the Obamas. When, when Barack Obama w won the presidency, he had never had a dog, and for good reason. His daughter Malia is allergic to dogs. Uh, and yet, moving to the White House, Gotta get you had to get a dog. <laughs> you know, you see you know, presidents are rolling on the ground with a dog. George Bush was good at that. Yeah. Um, and even Obama's were playing with his dog. The, it, it conveys some warmth, mm. and that warmth turns out to be important. So the family ties that you have, the volunteer work that you do, the concern you demonstrate for other people, and the time you spend with your dog, that demonstrates warmth in a way that helps us build trust. So it's competence and warmth. How does trash talking impact performance? Uh, well, that's one of my favorite topics. So trash talking is a construct that captivates me. Why in a competitive situation would somebody trash talk somebody else? And it could be that it psychs us up, it psychs ourselves up, um, but it can have unintended consequences in really motivating somebody else. Mm. So one of the things that happens is, when I start engaging in trash talking, you become more invested, You're, the, the psychological stakes are greater for you, you become more interested in beating me. And I've run a number of studies looking at this and it's so fun because people become just enraged <laughs> and focused. And when we feel anger, it's very motivating. Now, it's not great for precision or careful tasks. Mm. We can lose our focus a little bit mm -hmm. if we need sort of a delicate or steady hand. So you can imagine, let's say a golf player, they need a steady hand. That anger, that extra motivation is not helpful. If it's a long distance runner, it's incredibly powerfully motivating. Mm -hmm. Now, so trash talking motivates the target of the trash talking and it can also motivate the person doing the trash talking. But for both, it, it raises the psychological stakes. And you see this a lot with rivalry. Within rivalry, where the psychological stakes are already high, this is something that can elevate it still more. And if you want to turn somebody into an instant rival, trash talking is a way to go. Well, we're seeing so much of it already in the 2016 election cycle and sort of the Trump phenomenon. Do you see anything interesting in how different candidates are reacting differently to oh, the trash talking? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, is it strategic on their part? It's super strategic. And you see, for example, uh, I mean, Trump is letting loose with a lot of trash talking. And in some cases it works, in some cases it doesn't. Mm. So he really got under Jeb Bush's skin with the low energy yeah. idea. And Jeb Bush has been trying to counter that idea right. and saying, oh, I'm a high energy person or Jeb's a high energy name. I mean, silly stuff, like, like he's really playing into it. And in that case, Trump is succeeding in knocking out what he perceived to be his most serious rival, mm -hmm. at least at that time. Now, when he went after Rubio, it didn't work. And I think it's sort of mixed with Carly Fiorina. Like mm. that, he had ended up having to walk back and mm. 
the problem is you end up looking like a mean-spirited bully. Mm -hmm. And my advice is when you're going negative in a campaign, that's the kind of thing that works best when you're down to the finalists. Mm. When you come down to you know, the final Republican versus Democrat, a lot of negative ads get run. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people get sort of tuned out or they feel like, well, I don't like either of these, but uh, I'll go with the one I like, le you know, the sort of the lesser of the two evils. There, the negative campaigning can work. Mm -hmm. When it's at this early stage and you have so many rivals, it's very hard to get it all right without it coming back mm. to you. Is it an interesting reaction that so many people are really into the trash talking or the, what they perceive as non-politically correct? Yeah, so, so, there's something, so, so there's something, right, so there's yeah. sort of the straight talk is sort of appealing. And there's some candidates like Chris Christie who intended to develop his whole campaign based upon straight talk. And he's been out straight talked by Trump. Hmm. So, so Trump, comes out looking, you know, I'm not PC and here's, you know, here's me. So there's a sort of rebellious mm. allure about it. There's also something very refreshing. That is, we find, you know, like we don't know what candidates are really saying or thinking. Mm. And I think Hillary Clinton is sort of the opposite extreme. Here's somebody who's so careful, who's so right. studied, who ran a campaign and for the f first several months never held any press conferences you don't really know what she's thinking or what she's doing and sort of, you know, the, I, I think one reason why this email controversy has lasted mm. so long is because she was very careful about the words she used in describing it and so yeah. nobody knows quite what's going on or what's going through her head. With Trump, you know what's going through his head. He's saying it. Every last thing, right? So, so it's sort of refreshing, <laughs> it's rebellious. And I think he has appealed to some people who want change it's not really a, a mass movement of Americans. Mm. He hasn't appealed to a, a middle America just yet. It's, it's really a, a sort of a smaller fringe of people that are really tuning into it all. Mm. And with 17 candidates and maybe now 16 or 15, mm. um, it's such a diffuse area, he's right. the one that's able to grab attention. Mm -hmm. And I think at this stage, it's about grabbing attention. Mm. And it'll have to be a transition for people to now take a candidate more seriously. So let's talk friend and foe. Why is this an important book right now? And who should be reading it? I think friend and foe is an incredibly important work and I'm totally unbiased. <laughs> In friend and foe, we talk about navigating our social relationships. And these are social relationships at work and at home with our friends, our spouses, our kids our colleagues and our bosses. That is, what we're looking at in this book is how we, we navigate these shifting sands where, for example, you can think about two colleagues at work. We have to collaborate to get a job done, but then we compete for a promotion or raise recognition for that project. And how we manage that competition will feed back into how we cooperate the next time. Mm. And rather than just competing with our colleagues or just cooperating with our colleagues, it's important to recognize that we do both and there are ways for us to navigate this more efficiently, more effectively, so that we can do better and our colleagues can do better, rather than making, I think, some mistakes by over-competing or sometimes over-collaborating or collaborating in the wrong ways at the wrong times. So we can recognize opportunities to collaborate more wholly. And, and even when you think, think about like siblings, we think mm -hmm. about siblings, you know, brotherly love. These are our closest, best friends, but also sibling rivalry. And I think we have both of these inherent tensions. And you see some siblings, like the, the Williams sisters, so Serena and, mm -hmm. v and Venus, are magnificent at going back and forth. They're doubles, they compete against each other in singles, but at the end they give each other a nice hug. They, they're really tremendous at navigating that tension, yeah. and it's work. I think for most of us, it's harder work, and I think our book makes this more explicit. What's going on? Where are we cooperating? Where are we competing? How can we navigate this tension in a way that helps us make sure we preserve these relationships and actually 
develop them, and in some cases, we can pull competitors and bring them over to collaborators, so we're working together to accomplish aims much more effectively. And, and ultimately, I really do think this book can help managers, it can help people that are starting off in their careers, and it can help people at home too. We tend to kind of think of ourselves as either really competitive people or super cooperative people. We kind of label our personalities or it gets labeled for us. But you say this isn't really so. Why is that? Whether we like it or not, we need to collaborate and we need to compete. And we might not like the competition. And for some of us, we will we'll stay away from competitive domains. So we might not negotiate for the raise. We might not stick up for ourselves. But for some of us that are really incredibly averse to conflict, we're still competing. Mm. And we might go back and at home, we're going to work really hard on something to try to show somebody that we're you know, outshining them in this way or something. So we're all competitive. We're all collaborative. There are individual differences. The idea that I would sort of advocate is that we go back and forth, and we're doing both. And we could do both more effectively. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we're competing when we should be collaborating, and sometimes we're collaborating when we should be competing. We need to find that balance, and it's not easy. Yeah. And for some of us, it's perhaps harder than others. Why do we tend to compete with the people closest to us? You were talking about sibling rivalries earlier. Why do we pick the people who we're closest to? Well, there are a couple of reasons. So first of all, the people closest to us, those are the people that we're most likely to compare ourselves to. Mm. Now, these comparisons are incredibly pervasive. When we try to figure out how we're doing, so am I making enough money? Do I need to remodel my kitchen? Do I need a new car? We're trying to make these decisions. It's hard for us to figure it out in some objective terms. I don't know how good my vacation really was, until I go into Facebook and see everybody <laughs> else's vacation. Good for that, isn't it? <laughs> right? uh, and we're engaging these, these comparisons. Yeah. And the most intense comparisons are with people close to us mm -hmm. in self-relevant domains. By self-relevant, I mean if I really care about my work, then it's the person in the cubicle next to me who's doing similar work. That's going to be my benchmark. Mm -hmm. Often our siblings serve as ready benchmarks. They're always available. Uh, At every stage of life. <laughs> throughout life. I mean, I mean, as we go through life. So almost every decision that we make, we need to, some feedback. Am I doing well or not? Did I get married at the right time? Is it too early, too late? Do, am I having the right number of kids? I mean, these are complicated decisions. Even do I weigh the right amount? Mm. We look around and the people closest to us serve as these benchmarks and they help inform us to figure out how am I doing and so whether we like it or not even non-consciously we're going to be comparing ourselves mm -hmm. to the people closest to us and sometimes that's going to be helpful and constructive will give us some some good information uh, yeah maybe I should be buying insurance or maybe I should be doing something else that's you know going to the gym is perhaps a good idea but sometimes it's going to drive us crazy with these comparisons mm -hmm. and it can make us perfectly miserable. And so that's why people who check Facebook a lot, um, there have been studies looking at how they actually engage in so many comparisons, they're actually a little less happy. Uh, yeah. So we want to think about how we find the right balance here too in, in comparing ourselves to people in a ways that can motivate us, help us be engage in constructive behaviors, but not make us perfectly miserable by recognizing we can't ever, you know, beat everybody else out there. Mm. It's like driving on the highway and you're trying to pass every car. Y you can't win. Uh, we need to figure out a way to balance mm. those two drives. How can you go about interacting with coworkers and colleagues or even family members without inciting jealousy? So the flip side is, is to recognize, and this is important, everybody around you is also comparing themselves with you. And this will happen even when they say things like, uh, you know, imagine you win that coveted promotion. You've been trying, you've been working really hard. You really think it was well-deserved and you got it. And now 
somebody comes up and says, oh, congratulations, I'm so happy for you. You really deserved it. Now, naturally, we're gonna say, yeah, you know, I really did deserve it, thank you very much. I'm happy that you're happy for me. Now, really, truly, there could be some envy in what they're feeling. And it's important for us, it's incumbent for us to recognize that when we achieve successes, other people may also envy us our success, mm -hmm. even if they would agree that we deserved it, we worked right. really hard for it, we are gonna be targets of envy. Now, what can we do? There are a couple things. First, we could be modest. So when you remodel your kitchen, you don't have to post all of the photos onto Facebook. You don't have to give everybody a tour whenever they come over. It may be your best friends you can show them, but you don't want to broadcast everything you've done and in a way that you, know, you should recognize might also induce envy. Second, you want to, want to make sure that right after some good successes have come to you, other people may actually resent you for that. And you might want to build bridges with people. Mm. We find that, for example, people that have had successes trust others a little bit too much. So this is when, after you've had successes, people want to pull you down. And you can do things like share some of the challenges you've had along the way, or share some of the setbacks that you've had. Share credit, say, look, this really reflects a group effort. All of us got us here. It wasn't the work I did alone. And I want to really acknowledge other people. And sometimes we can be more modest as we reveal information. So when you go to mm -hmm. Fiji, you have that great experience. And people ask, hey, how is your vacation? If you tell them that, well, it rained a lot and they lost my luggage, but you know, it's great to be home. That's often enough, as opposed to, oh, let me show you the photos. Here are the 6,000 photos of me in the shark cage. <laughs> and you know, the, there are ways for us to be more modest sometimes. Right. Um, and I think it's helpful to recognize, in our minds, we don't think that other people are going to be envious of us nearly as often as they may mm. be. What is the role of power in the friend and foe dynamic? Power is always part of our relationships. Power means that we have some control, and people are trying to gain more control. The more power we have, the better the resources we get. And it could be more attention from our parents, it could be more recognition within a company, it could be control over resources like a bigger budget to spend or more, or more people to manage. Those resources were hardwired to crave. And so we're always jockeying for positions of power. Mm. And one thing that's interesting is that we know from social science, when we have some power hierarchy, there's some structure, and every human organization throughout time, th throughout history, lines up into some hierarchy, and people implicitly know where they are. We tend to self-enhance on many levels, but we don't like to step out of line with our power. So when we right. say, we think we have more power than we do, people push us back. Mm. So we're jockeying for power. Power is really important in our relationships. And we find that within a hierarchy, things can be very stable once we've figured out what that hierarchy is. Mm. When the power dynamic is unstable, we're not really sure, that's when we're likely to see more conflict mm. and less group cohesion. And we have cohesion within a group, we're able to, you know, as an organization, we can function much more efficiently, much more collaboratively. And this is why, for example, a lot of Adam Galinsky's research with, with, with others have shown that, for example, co-CEO leadership mm -hmm. doesn't work well. It's good to have one powerful person at the top so we know who's the most influential person that can then guide and coordinate hmm. Uh, the rest of the organization. What is the science behind gossip? Gossip is interesting, and I think gossip gets a bad rap unfairly. We often rail against people for gossiping, and yet there really isn't anything quite as delicious as, as hearing like really good gossip. Now, s taking a step back, sort of scientifically, wh what is gossip doing? And gossip is interesting because we think of it as a competitive mm -hmm. event, and it is. So we're gossiping about somebody else, 
and we're doing something competitive against someone else. And yet, as we're doing that, we're drawing us closer. So it's a more intimate experience for us. We're sharing something and we become better friends with some other person who's an outgroup foe. Now, that's part of what's happening. So it's binding us together. The second thing that it's happening is we convey ideas about the norms and expectations and standards. Mm. So in an organization, we talk, we start gossiping about somebody else's bad behavior. We're also sharing information about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. And we're conveying information that I think helps the whole organization function because we're, we're figuring out where the lines are mm. and these are unwritten rules right. that we might not otherwise get. So gossip is, is playing important functions in a couple of ways and it is, it can be harmful to the person who's being the target of the gossip, but I think we miss out on recognizing the, these other functions that gossip also provides. Now, I'm not wholesaling door, endorsing gossip, but I, I think it's, it's helpful to be mindful of the broader set of things that gossip is doing. Every chapter of your book ends with a segment about finding the right balance. Why? For every force that we engage in, uh, and, and, and through, the, through the book we talk about trust, for example, where we need to find our balance. So we talked about the importance of trust. Trust is essential for effective leadership, for effective organizations. And yet if we're too trusting, that's what sets up the opportunity for exploitation. Mm. So all of the scams, uh, people exploit us when we're too trusting. So there's a balance to that. We talked about social comparisons. So we engage in these comparisons. We constantly engage in these comparisons, but we can shift ourselves so we find the right balance so that we're motivated by our comparisons without being demotivated or feeling really frustrated and discontent. So we can find our balance and sometimes it involves shifting our focus so we compare ourselves with different people or we figure out a way to constructively engage in comparisons so we're motivated to work harder and we can find our balance in a way that helps us navigate these social relationships. We're all intertwined in so many relationships. We need to navigate that balance in a way that, that helps us rather than uh, hurts us. So that's the idea and so across the book from power, hierarchy, comparisons, trust, deception. We talk about gender differences and, and more. Across everything, we need to really find our balance. Maurice, thank you so much for being here with us today and sharing all of your wisdom and research with us. It's been tremendously interesting and helpful. So oh, great. Well, thank you. Thank you. This is Sartor TV. I'm Jennifer Crumpton. Thanks so much for stopping by today, and we'll see you next time.